Welcome to section two, IPv4 addressing and subnetting. So here in section two, we're gonna talk about subnets. In this section, it's gonna be all IP and all subnetting all the time. But before we get into subnetting, let's discuss and review some topics related to the internet protocol. So what is an IP address? Well, quite simply, an IP address is a unique number given to a network device, such as a router or host, to uniquely identify them to other devices for the purpose of routing data between a source and destination. So as a network admin or really any type of computer user, we typically come across two types of IP addresses, a version four IP address and a version six IP address. Now we focus on version four in this course because we're learning subnetting, but later I'm gonna give you some characteristics and advantages of version six, one of which is not having to subnet addresses because of the many addresses that are possible with IPv6. So if we examine an IP address on the left, an IPv4 address, we can see that this is a 32-bit number formatted in a dotted decimal notation. Now we also have a short format or the prefix format, which is called a CEDAR, which is classless interdomain routing. But for now, don't worry about that. CEDAR was a way to slow down the exhaustion of IP version four addresses, but really more on that later. So notice the number of addresses. Because we're only using a 32-bit number, we're limited to a number of about 4 million total unique addresses. Now, 4 million addresses, that's not a lot. So you can probably ask yourself, well, how does the internet even function? Well, the short story is the best that it can. Basically, we've all but exhausted the version 4 address space as it relates to writable addresses over the internet. So to combat this problem, the Internet Engineering Task Force, they came up with IP version six. Now, if you look at IP version six, you can see that we've got an insane number of addresses available to use. Because IP version six uses a 128 bit number, we have about 350 unit decilon unique addresses that we can use in our networks. So we probably shouldn't run out of these anytime soon which is why they picked a 128-bit address space rather than a 64-bit address space. Now, to deal with these incredibly large numbers in IP version 6, we use the hexadecimal notation. So with all that being said, how does an IP address work? Well, as we mentioned, an IP is a unique address that helps to identify your device and the location of your device. So we can simply relate an IP address to a house address. For example, my house address is 156 Maple Ave in Hamden, Connecticut. The address is used to send mail to the destination, of course, which is my house. However, having a simple destination is not sufficient enough to effectively route mail, right? We also need a zip code. For example, my zip code is 06514. So in our analogy, the zip code allows the post office to identify the group of houses within a specific postal area, because of course there could be more than one Maple Ave in the United States. The zip code is equivalent to our network address. So if we think about this in network language, to first route data to our device, we need to know what address we have, that's our IP, and then what area we live in, this is our network address. So then the IP address is used by the router in the routing process to send a packet to its destination using the source and destination address. So to get data between networks, we need to employ the use of a router. So let's talk about routers for a second. What is a router? What's the router's job throughout this whole moving of the data process? So a router's job, of course, is to route IP packets between networks. Well, why is this important? Well, because using software, the host is going to decide where a packet will eventually end up. This is, of course, its destination. Now, as a user, we've got some control of this at the application layer. For example, if you enter www.google.com in the address bar of your browser, you are in essence specifying the destination of your transmission. Now, although there's some additional software in play here, namely DNS, which resolves the name www.google.com to an IP address, the software and the router work together to perform the routing process. This happens at layer three of the OSI model. A router can perform this functionality by consulting as a routing table. The table consists of groups of IP networks, and when a router receives a packet, it's going to look at the destination and decide where to send the packet next. So in our simple example, we have a basic network with two hosts connected to the router. And when a request is made by the user for google.com, the user's packet is sent to the router for processing. The router will consult its IP address table and make a decision to where to send the packet next. Now this may include one or many routers, 
each moving packets between networks until the final server of google.com is reached and a communication between the two devices can be established. Now the cool thing about routers is that they can learn about other routers close to them and examine different routes to remote networks and decide which path is most efficient to route the packets. So we're going to be touching on routing a little bit while we discuss IP and subnetting. So you want to make sure that you understand how a router functions. Now this is especially important because the routing topic is tested on extensively during the CCNA exam within its exam scenarios. Before we get too much further into IP addressing, let's look at some terminology we'll use while describing IP addresses and networking. Hopefully you've seen these before, but of course we'll take a look at them again just for review. So first we have a bit. A bit in the context of our binary address is just a single position value of a one or zero. This is contained within our dotted IP address. To the right of that, we have a byte. A byte is an 8-bit number represented in binary form, and these make up one of four blocks within our dotted IP address. Below that, we have an octet. An octet is just a different representation of our byte. It's represented in decimal form. This is the name we give one of our four blocks of our IP address. To the right of that, we have an IP address. Of course, we've seen this before. This is the unique number assigned to our devices. And to the right of the IP address, we have a subnet mask. So now, what is a subnet mask? This is a 32-bit number similar to our IP address that defines a range of IP addresses available within a given network. We use this primarily when we start to divide up networks or subnet them, right? This basically means that by looking at a subnet mask, we can tell exactly which network a specific IP falls within. This operation is performed by looking at the bits in the subnet and the bits in the IP address, and then by adding them together in binary, so doing some binary math. So you might be asking yourself, okay, well, why is it called a subnet mask? That's an interesting name, right? Well, this is because the subnet mask basically masks or hides the host identifier of the address and reveals only the network addresses. So it's used for speed, basically. In our last row, we have a network address. Our network address is used in the routing process to move packets to and from devices that are located on different networks. The network address uniquely identifies a network. You can also call this a network number, and every host on a given network will share that same network address. In our example here, our IP address, as you can see in the middle row, this is part of the 192.168.0 network. So 192.168.0.0 is the network address. And lastly, we have the broadcast address. We've talked about this a little bit already, but this is used by devices to send information to all hosts on the same network. That's the IP address terminology we'll use throughout the course. And really, you want to remember that the IP address, the host address, the subnet mask, and the broadcast address are really the foundations of how IP addressing works. Well, let's examine IP architecture and how we divide our 32-bit address space into networks and addresses. So as you've seen already, we can write an IP address in a few forms. We've got the dotted decimal notation, which is pretty familiar to you by now. We've got hexadecimal, which is typically associated with IPv6. And lastly, we've got our IP address in binary form. Just remember here that these are the same representations of the same number. So we've talked about our IP address, but really how are they formed? How did the internet designers decide how these addresses are signed and broken up? Well, network addressing is how we divide and identify networks. The first system we'll take a look at quickly is the classful system. This is how we used to break up networks historically. Now I say historically because the classful addressing system that we see here was decommissioned in 1993 in favor of the classless system. However, understanding how classful addressing works is a simple progression to understanding classless addressing, and we'll see that next. So in a classful system, the 32-bit address space is broken up into five classes, three of which are used for our routing data. These are classes A through C. In each class, our four octets of each address are broken up to accommodate a certain number of networks and hosts, depending on the required scale. This means that each bit in our binary number is dedicated to a network or host. This is reflected in the range. For example, in our class A network, the first octet is devoted to the network. These bits, other than the first, are flipped to 1, and they can't be used to address hosts. This gives us a range of 0 through 127 that we can use for network addressing. The other bits we can use for device addressing, and this gives us a large number of hosts, but a small number of networks. 
This is in contrast to a class C network where we do have three octets available for a large number of networks, but we're limited to a small number of hosts that's set by the host bits. So in practice, to accommodate a network with a large number of hosts, you might choose a class A or B network. These give you a level of scalability when creating enterprise networks. To create a network with a small number of hosts, you might choose a class C network. With class C networks, even though there are a limited number of hosts, it makes the network easier to read and maintain. Now the next question you might ask yourself is, why do the designers do it in this way? Well, the short answer is speed and efficiency. By dividing the 32-bit address space into classes, the router can make fast decisions. For example, it's required that in a class A network, that the first bit of the first octet is always zero. In class B networks, the first two bits are set at one and zero. And in a class C network, the first three bits are one, one, zero. So when a router begins to decide where to route a packet, to increase its processing speed and efficiency, it looks at only the first couple of bits and then it knows exactly which network the packet belongs to. In addition to helping the router, if we're to flip the rest of the bits of the octet, this reveals the range of our network. So by using this design, a class A gives us 128 networks we can use. In a class B, it gives us 16,384 networks we can use. And in a class C network, it gives us 2,097,152 networks. Also by using this classful method, we can see that in a class A network, the first octet is devoted to the network, leaving the last three for the node addresses. This gives us about 16,777,216 addresses that we can use for nodes. In a class B, it gives us 65,534 that we can address to nodes. And in a class C, we can give 254 addresses to nodes. So you might be asking yourself, well, why is this the power of 2 minus 2? Well, that's because if you look below to have a proper network boundary, we need a node address, we need a network address, and we need a broadcast address. Hence, the available addresses for our nodes is the octet space minus address for the network and address for the broadcast. For example, in our class C network, we have the last octet available for addresses. This is an 8-bit space, and it's equal to 256 if we were to calculate the powers of 2. But we need a network address and a broadcast address. This leaves us 254 available addresses to assign to nodes.